Hello, this is Greg Allison from Green Greg's Garden and Worm Farm, coming to you straight from my worm farm. And uh, today we're going to talk about worms. We're going to talk about what are the five key things you need to know to raise worms so that you can successfully raise them and so that they don't die on you. The five most important things that you absolutely have to know to raise worms. And the last step I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you what most people do wrong that kills their worms and how to avoid it. How not to kill your worms. That is the last thing I'm going to tell you. And it is the most important thing I can tell you of anything I ever tell you. So please stay tuned to hear that. And I'm also going to start out with a little bit of worm physiology. That's going to be the first key thing to know about worms. So uh, I'm going to have a lot of videos about worms, including more details on each of these steps I'm going to talk about. So in order to keep up with this, uh, you want to see all the updates, all the new videos on my channel, so please subscribe and bang the bell to uh, get the update notifications. That way you'll get notifications on all my videos about worm farming, about aquaponics, about raised bed gardening, organic gardening, raising herbs, about microgreens, a lot of stuff we're going to cover here. So stay tuned for that. Now, what I'm going to tell you about worms, the first thing you need to know is their physiology. And the physiology of worms is really important because worms are interesting little creatures. So basically physiology, what's a worm? That's what we're going to talk about, that simple. Put it in plain English. Well, golly gee, let's have a look. There's a worm. Uh, let's see, here we are, we got them in focus now. Now that's a, pretty much a baby worm. How I know that? Uh, I don't see much of a band on this worm, so I would declare this to be a baby rip. Uh, this is a baby red worm because he don't have much of a band on him. Let's see what else we can find in the worm bed here. Ah, oh, lots of worms in here. Look at that. And uh, so we can get it here. We can get in the light a little bit. These are all pretty young worms here. Uh, you may notice that worms have a band on them when they get to be an adult. That's how you can tell a worm is an adult, by the band. And uh, I'm going to see if I can pull out a few more worms here. This one is starting to get a band. So I believe he's an adult. And if there weren't so much stuff on these worms, you could see more. I'm sure that's an adult. Young adult. What we got here? <laughs> Trying to hide. Okay. I'm going to put these worms back in their worm bed. I'm going to try to gently rake them in there. See all these guys down in here. See what they like to do is hide. I see a band right there. This guy has a band on him. An adult. Okay, the key thing is worms. They breathe through their skin. They don't have lungs. So they can't drown per se, not technically. They don't have lungs to drown. And they actually breathe through the moisture in the bedding. So they have to have a little moisture in the bed, but not soppy wet. You don't want a warm bed soppy wet. Now here's the thing. So this is the first thing we're going to talk about. It's the physiology. The uh, worm uh, can die if he's in too much water. Most people say they're drowning. It's technically not drowning. What is happening, what most, we don't really know for sure, what most experts think is they're dying from a carbonic acid that builds up on their skin. They breathe through their skin, they take the oxygen in through their skin, and they exhale carbon dioxide out through their skin. Well, apparently that carbon dioxide builds up in the water and creates an acid on the outside of the worms. One thing a worm is intolerant to is acid. And we're going that we're going to come back to, because that's related into the biggest mistake people make with worms. Now, a worm's body is like the inside of your mouth. It's a very soft skin. Their entire body is a soft skin like that. So they're very sensitive to things like uh, acid, uh, and that's why they could die in pure water. That's why they don't want, you don't need a soppy, wet worm bed, although it's okay maybe if one little area is wet. They might go to that to get water. Uh, I prefer worm beds that are well drained. Now, a worm has a lot of heart. Actually, a worm has five hearts. It's like five little blood vessels that constrict and uh, pump the blood through the worm. So you talk about heart, worms have it. Five hearts. The other thing to know about worms is they are 
asexual. Actually, no. They're both sexes. They're hermorphodotic. Every worm is both male and female. Every worm, both male and female. And when they mate, they lay up side to side and they exchange eggs and sperm. And uh, it goes into a mucus, which rolls off the end of the worm into a golden little orb. Some people call them eggs. Technically, that's a cocoon. And within that cocoon can be up to two to seven eggs for these red worms. Some worms only put one or two eggs in a cocoon. I think the bigger ones usually just a couple. But these guys will put up to seven eggs. These guys can double in population every two to three months. And when I first got my worms, they were guaranteed doubling or better than doubling. I was getting worms like crazy every two months. I started out with like 50,000 worms, and a year later I had probably had a million and a half. I mean, those guys, they, they, they were putting some eggs out. So, uh, that's the key thing about a worm, is that uh, being sensitive, they don't like light. Uh, if you notice, they're not out here in the open. And that's going to come back to some of the other things I'm about to tell you about worms. They will dive down to stay, get away from the light because they're, it's just their training because ultraviolet can kill them and light can dry them out, sunlight. So they've got to stay down in the bedding. Plus, they need bedding to breathe, as I mentioned. And if you notice, this bedding looks like chocolate cake. This is nice, rich worm castings in here. This stuff's all ready to sell, really. It's nice, rich, rich, rich worm castings. So the cool thing about it is um, uh, it, it's, it's not soppy wet. It's I got a cake consistency. You see that? Now, so that comes back to uh, these other things I've got to tell you, and that is uh, containers. Now, if you notice, I've got here a wooden container that I've got my worms in. This is the second thing you need to know. These are just plywood containers that I've built. These are some of my best worm beds because they're above ground, and uh, the way they're built, they keep moles out for the most part. And that's one of my chief pest problems, which that's one of the other things we'll talk about is pests. The lid also keeps pests out. It helps keep the, the, the worms from escaping. So what you need in the bedding is preferably something that drains. I know a lot of people put worms in concrete bins and buckets that do not drain out. And I don't know, but if I was a worm, I wouldn't want to be living in all my waste forever. I'd like at least the liquid stuff to drain away. So uh, my beds all have drain holes down here in the bottom. There's screen wire on the other side of that. And it's just stapled into the wood. Screen wire here for air holes. they got to be able to breathe. So they need air holes and drain holes in reality. And here you can see the screen wire. It's literally stapled on with a regular staple gun. And that's just regular metal screen wire. And it does staple on pretty easily. And that's the cool thing. It don't take a lot. Uh, you can also use other things for bedding. For example, I brought out here just a couple of visual aids to talk from. No, I wouldn't raise them in a can. But you could use a five gallon bucket in similar fashion. The problem with a bucket is that uh, the worms are only going to live in about the top six inches of the soil unless it's real cold. So having all this down here, don't buy anything unless it's not drained, which a lot of people don't do, and that's where it all settles to. Uh, so that's how they get away with not having drained sometimes, having that deep bucket. But it's usually not buying you a lot for your worms. Another way to do it is to have other containers. Now this is right size container for school projects. Uh, I do fix these type containers up sometimes for school projects. Okay, these are here today because they're easy to carry and they simulate the big totes you can get from Walmart. But like I said, you can actually raise some worms in these, just a small quantity. I wouldn't put uh, over a pound in one of these and maybe not even that much. But what, what you can do with the Walmart totes is you can use a bottom container and put a block in the bottom of it so that the other container don't settle all the way to the bottom and uh, also if it does it makes it hard to pull apart but what this does is it enables you to drill holes in the bottom of this container and let it the drippings drip and drain in here and that contains it so it's not running out all over the place and then you can uh, uh, just uh, remove this guy pull the drippings out and make worm tea or just put the drippings, the, the leachate as we call it, directly into your 
potted plants, your garden, whatever you want to do with it like that. It's valuable stuff. It makes plants grow. Uh, but you can brew it and make worm tea out of it and make it even more powerful, which is a topic we'll be covering in the not too distant future. And I'll also be going into detail on how to build uh, various types of beds and containers for your worms other than this real quick thumbnail sketch I'm giving you. This is just to give you an idea. The holes you would drill would be tiny, about 530 seconds. Uh, and then you would put a, a layer of wet sand around the holes. A lot of your totes have a recessed area. That's where I didn't even put the wet sand right over that. Or just have a layer of wet sand in the bottom. That way, the wet sand won't drain through the holes and it stops the compost from going through them. And uh, otherwise, the compost will actually stop the holes up and it won't drain at all. And it also keeps your worms from getting away. So it lets the water pass through. So wet sand is a perfect thing to use. Uh, another thing you could do is screen wire like you see on my big beds. You could put bigger holes in here and put screen wire in there. And for plastic, you'd want to use a hot glue gun, I suppose. Some people use a little thicker plastic containers and they tap and thread a hole and actually put a spigot in it. Well, you can do that. So the honest to truth is, there is many ways to raise worms just about as you can imagine. But here's the key thing you need to know in the, in the uh, containers you raise them in, is that they live in the top six inches, mostly in the bedding. Uh, if you have thicker bedding, which is sometimes desirable just for thermal mass so they can live outdoors, uh, about a foot, maybe two foot in most areas will work just fine. Uh, it gets down below freezing here in uh, North Alabama. I'm eight miles south of Tennessee border. Uh, used it about three times per winter, last few winters, and it will stay maybe below freezing and get down to the single digits for maybe three nights consecutive. Um, that's about as hard as our winters get. Uh, it is December the 15th today. I could be wearing a short sleeve shirt right now. It's not cold at the moment, but we've had some real hard cold snaps already this fall. So um, that's the key things about the bed. Uh, excuse me, about the... Uh, Containers is that they've got to provide overall protection. You want something that keeps the pest out. It's got to be, you really want it where it can drain the water out. It's got to have access for air. And if you do a uh, tote top container, drill holes in the top too for air. And the cool thing about that, having holes in the bottom and holes in the top, is you get a flow. As the water leaks down through the top, it pulls air in. Was, yeah, as water leaks down into the bottom thing, it pulls the air in from the top. So, um, in small holes, the worm in the roof, uh, the worms aren't going to get away out of. Uh, one other phys physiological thing you need to know that I should go back to, and, and it ties into the containers, are worms are great escape artists. So, uh, uh, having a uh, lid that shuts pretty tight is a good way to keep a majority of them from escaping, although they can crawl through cracks. Another thing you can do is put a light overhead, not directly overhead to the point where it's going to cook them. You don't want to cook your worms and dry your bedding out, but a bright light far enough overhead that you won't have a problem with that. Because again, as I mentioned earlier, worms don't like light, so that's one way to keep them in. Uh, so the uh, we'll cover in some future videos of quite a bit about containers. I will show you how to build containers, including these boxes. I will show you how to build in-ground beds. I will show you how to build bedding from Walmart totes and other things. So um, outside of that, the next thing you need to know, the third item, is the bedding itself. Uh, a lot of people make mistakes on the bedding, especially when they watch YouTube videos where people are just trying to make videos. Um, these are earthworms, really compost worms. A lot of people think you can just throw them in dirt. No, they're not really dirt worms. These are compost worms. These are the worms that make your compost for you, the red worms, the Senia fetinata. Uh, and same is true for uh, the, the uh, uh, large, larger uh, worms. They're also uh, night crawlers. They're also uh, compost worms. They're not a dirt worm. So. Even dirt worms don't like dirt too much unless they're getting away. Worms love compost because that's what they can eat. And it's good bed and it has the right moisture usually for them. So if you notice, my bedding is not a pile of food or a pile of paper. Uh, this started out as horse manure. It's not horse manure. Now, don't look anything like it because these worms have turned it into worm castings. They've processed it through many times. And uh, what's, they've contributed to it, the food they've ate, and they've converted it. It is not, nor does it resemble in any fashion, uh, horse manure. 
but you can use horse manure as a bedding. But what you want to use is well composted horse manure or cow manure that has been sitting outside for several months in the rain and weather getting leached out any chemicals they might have fed the animals and most importantly you don't want it to go through the heat phase so if it's several months old the bacteria is already processed it enough that it shouldn't go into a heat phase although I have had a friend who uh, used old horse manure out of a barn thought it would be good but it never got the moisture and as soon as it did it went into a heat uh, the thermophilic bacteria in bedding can reach 180 degrees and that is, they do that to kill out everything except for themselves so they can have their food to themselves until they're t tired of it and get what they want out of it and then they die off and other organisms move back in. It's still really good and rich for other things deep but while they're in that heat phase nothing's going to survive including worms and you're not going to survive in 180 degrees either. And then I mentioned worms are uh, soft bodied creatures like the inside of your mouth. Imagine taking the inside of your mouth, wrapping around your body and throwing yourself in a 180 degree kiln. Eh, you're not going to be happy. <laughs> and neither will your worms. Uh, you know, that kind of goes back to containers. Don't put your worms in a metal building that's all closed up where it's going to get super hot inside. So, um, getting back to the bedding. The key things are you want a bedding that uh, the worms can, can move through easily. You want it where to have some moisture in it but not sop and wet, as I mentioned. Now, I have seen the YouTube videos where they're just throwing paper in a tote. Just filling it full of paper or food. It's amp, amp, no, 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 and heck no. Uh, those guys are just making videos. Uh, yeah, you can put shredded paper in the beds, but what you don't want to do is to put it into the extent and water it to such an extent that you're going to have a glop of wet paper, paper mache. Because if it's just a glop of paper, uh, how's the worm going to move through it? How's it going to breathe? It's going to get caught in there and suffocate, or it's going to dry out and turn into a brick. You know, like a little piece of, uh, I don't know, a, a, a cast or something, you know, dried paper mache is hard. Uh, paper mache is a bad idea. Anything that's going to make paper mache you don't want. So paper's fine. Worms love paper. Look here. I've got paper in here. I got uh, the boxes and the lights I bought from my microgreens. I did use a feed bag for my rabbits in here. So you can see I do use paper and they do eat it. Uh, this paper has just probably got in here. They've not been eating too much on this yet. But look at all the worms that's hiding underneath here. Well, they're done. They're getting away from the light. Oh, wow. Hey, guys. Check out the worms. Got worms? There is worms. <laughs> and they love to be under these melons. They love to eat melons. There's some things a worm really loves. See that? Look at this. Yes, I've got worms. <laughs> I'm glad to have them. So... The bed needs to be moist, not dry, not wet, and uh, old horse manure, old cow manure works. You can use peat moss. Peat moss is a great bed. A lot of people use it, but a couple things to know about it. You need to let it soak 24 hours in advance. Yes, 24 hours soak on peat moss. And uh, then you got to take it out and squeeze the devil out of it, just fistful of time until just a drop of water comes out. So to get the peat moss bedding right in large content, that's a lot of work. It's a lot of work because most people want to leave it too wet. I ship my worms in peat moss. That's the only place I use peat moss is for shipping worms because it ships well and uh, it's not otherwise biologically active. It's inert uh, and um, if you squeeze it right, the worms will be fine. I can ship worms all year long. In the hottest days of the summer and the coldest days, no problem. Most worm farmers, when they ship worms in the hot weather, their worms die. Why? Because they don't squeeze that stuff out just right, or they don't moisturize it right in the first place. So uh, you get worms that are either dehydrated or they basically steam dead. It, it gets too hot with all that uh, water in there, and they'll steam. And... That happens to a lot of worms coming from a lot of other worm farmers and a lot of other big worm outfits. So if you're buying worms from certain uh, worm farms and your nose you're getting them dead, well, that's why, most likely. Uh, I don't have that problem. And if you get worms from me and they don't survive, I'm going to replace them. But the, uh, that's a key thing to know. You can use uh, compost from a compost pile for your bedding. Compost makes a wonderful bedding. Just make sure, again, it's gone through the heat phase. Uh, you can use paper, you can put in some food, uh, but if you notice my bedding 
it's not just rack full of food. And uh, th there's, th that's an important thing. So uh, the other thing you need to know about is pest control. What do you do to keep the pest out of your beds? Well, one is physical restraint. You know, you use, uh, pardon me, you build something that pests can't get into easily. That's what I get by this bed being elevated on block as it whole, keeps the moles from coming out. The blocks are recessed under this edge. So the mole would have to climb up and over a lip. And guess what? Moles can climb well, but they have a problem with that. If it were straight up, a mole might actually ascend up this bed. Moles can climb, and raccoons can climb. Uh, you can't use, uh, oh yeah, you can't use treated wood in these beds. I should have mentioned that earlier. No treated wood. That means the beds only last about three years when you make them out of wood. I do uh, paint the inside with oil when I first put them together. However, uh, as these things get about the, to the third year, when you're putting food stuff in there like uh, watermelon, which a raccoon likes to eat, a raccoon will tear a hole in the side of this bed to get in there. And what else will raccoons eat? Worms, unfortunately. So my biggest pest I have to worry about are moles and raccoons. With an in-ground bed, uh, you can put a, uh, let's uh, use one of these boxes again. Let's just imagine this, this thing is in the ground. Or imagine that's your pit in the ground, not the bed itself. Just imagine that's a hole. I would fill the bottom of it with about six inches of gravel. Then you can line the outside with cement block, cinder block, and uh, or you can build a bed with metal sheathing over here, something that won't rust out too fast. Anything else, the moles can come through. And I'm using metal sheathing now. My first in-ground beds I built with plywood because I was in a hurry to build them because I had a customer that was wanting a lot of worm castings fast and I didn't have money to, to build the better beds and now I'm paying for it because I got to go back and rebuild all those beds. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> so uh, the uh, the thing to know about uh, pest management though is um, not only uh, do you have the raccoons and the moles, uh, insects are a big problem for beds. But I've got that one down pat. You're not seeing insects in my bed. Oh yeah, of course, it's nearly winter now. But uh, what you can get is fly larva, uh, soldier flies. Soldier flies and fly larva aren't going to hurt your worms. They're going to eat your compost up. And if you're trying to sell worms, you don't want to be putting together worm packages and having to, to sort the, the fly larva out from the worms because customers don't want to get a bag full of fly larva. Trust me, I have bought worms from a worm farmer who sent me a lot of fly larvae and they opened the bag and some of them have already hatched and little flies come, come out. Oh, that's horrible. You don't want that. Uh, and if you do have fly larvae, yes, when you harvest those worms, you need to sort through that and get those little puppies out. Every one of them. I don't have that problem. Why? Because I use lime in my bed. Not garden lime like you buy at the store. I use pure crushed dolomite. The regular garden lime is toxic to your worms. So you want to use pure crushed dolomite. The pure crushed dolomite is uh, a mineral. It's, it is limestone, just crushed. You can get it from rock quarry. Some feed stores carry it, but usually the people working there don't know what it is. So you have to ask for it by name. Pure crushed dolomite. The thing to know about dolomite is that it comes typically in 40 pound bags. The bags are smaller than a 40 pound feed bag for like dog food. They tend to be, uh, you know, just so tall and so wide. You know, like I said, so wide and just so tall. They're not really big bags because the stuff is really dense. It is more dense than garden lime. If somebody is bringing you a big, big bag and it's 40 pounds, that's not pure crushed dolomite. That's garden lime. And uh, garden lime can be toxic to your worms. However, pure crushed dolomite is not it's actually kind of toxic to insects. Uh, insects, as I was trying to say, uh, actually want a bedding, a soil that's acidic. And so when you bring the pH more to the neutral side, give it a higher pH, what that does is it 
makes it very unattractive to the insects. I've not had insect problems in my beds since I've been using the dolomite. And how do I apply it? You don't just you don't go crazy with it. You just sprinkle, I mean just a light dusting on and sprinkle water on so it will dissolve. And that's usually all it takes. Just a little, very light dusting. Get you a little uh, pH strip and test if you need to. Uh, I don't ever do that because I just test, I, I put out just a little light dust and I see that's working and I don't bother with it anymore. But you can test it. Get the analysis and see right where you're at. For me it's kind of like cooking gravy. I just kind of mix things till it's right and it, it don't take a lot. But you can test everything and that's probably a good way to go. At least that way you know exactly quantitatively what you're doing. And uh, it just takes a little extra time, and my lifetime is a very precious resource. However, uh, the garden lime is something you have to stay away from in your worm beds. Use dolomite, pure crushed limestone. I call that lime, and technically it is, it's just not the chemically treated stuff. What you look for in your bag is any indication that's been hydrolyzed or chemically treated. That's the point I was trying to make earlier. Make sure it's not hydrolyzed. And, and, and when you read the ingredients, they will just be a list of minerals. A list of minerals. Because there are minerals in the limestone. It's not just pure calcium carbonate or whatever it is that limestone is made out of. So it has um, got other things in there. And that's fine. The, the minerals, later when you put this stuff in your garden, is going to be great for your garden. Now, that's why people like to put lime in gardens. But they use that on a, they use that chemically treated stuff. Why do we have to chemically treat everything? Like our water, for example. Oh my God. And we have to chemically treat rock powder? No. You don't have to. Trust me. Uh, the pure crushed dolomite is the way to go. And um, the uh, ants are a problem that you have to watch out for. But I don't have problems after I use that. That seems to control them. I will do a video sometime in the spring when the sugar ants are really out and I'll show you how you can kill them surefire kill the whole nest out if you should find a net nest in your bed warm bed then dig the nest out get it out uh, back in my early days I did have that problem uh, and I had some carbon ants got in there and I dug them out boom they were gone I think I had another ant nest in later I dug it out boom they were gone um, that you can do you can get the whole thing out all at once nice shovel does the job and the good thing about a worm bed, if you build it right, stuff like that's easier to get out. So um, in terms of ants also, you can put uh, comet powder around the beds. I'm told they don't like comet powder. I don't know. Uh, you can grease the legs of the beds. Let's say if this were your bed, you could grease it. Put grease around it, just uh, like axle grease. And that should do the trick. Also, uh, you can uh, do a lot of stuff. You can uh, take your beds, the, the, the feet of beds, the raised beds, and put them in cans of oil, especially if you're in a building. You don't do it outside because the water will just flush it out. But for people that raise indoors, I have seen where they have done that with beds. They've taken the feet and put them in big cans and put oil in it because the ant's not going to go through that oil. They can't do it. They can't make it. So there's a lot of little tricks like that you can do. But there's one other thing that helps control insects in beds, and that's believe it or not, it's a little bitty tiny little bug called a springtail. Seems that where you have springtails, you don't have much else. So those are all important points I just wanted to make. Uh, oh, springtails are not a problem. They don't bother your bedding. Uh, not really. They're part of your ecology. Any uh, worm bed is going to have an ecology in it. They're not going to hurt your plants when you put them in a garden. Uh, they're, they're mostly eating compost. One other thing I want to mention. Some people are afraid of worms in their garden. Because I've had somebody tell me, that, Oh, I kill worms in my garden because they'll eat my plant roots. No, they don't. A worm will not eat any living plant, any living thing. They only eat dead material. They do not bother live plants. What worms do is go through the soil and make the little tunnels and aerate the soil and make it great for the garden because the air can get through there, the water can drain through there really easily. The worms are the best thing you can put in your garden. And springtails don't cause any problems either. There may be some occasion where there's many different species where maybe they nibble just a small little fraction at your plants, but you will never notice it. So springtails are actually good because they do control some other things as far as I can tell. 
Um, so I would actually choose springtails. They're, they're tiny little bitty, uh, I guess it's called springtails because they can jump a little bit. They're tiny, look like little white specks unless you look at them real closely. And they look kind of like an insect, but they're not, I don't think they're actually a true insect. They're just a little tiny speck of a white bug. Anyway, so those are the key things you need to know about ants and uh, insects that can be controlled by dolomite. Okay, another pest for the beds is centipedes. Centipedes are similar to millipedes, but here's a key difference. On a millipede, in every body section, there's two legs sticking out each side. The centipede is just one. The centipedes tend to be redder, browner in color, and they got big pinchers on the front. Centipedes will eat worms. You don't want centipedes. centipedes. If you find them, kill them. Millipedes, eh, they're just a pest. Uh, they don't actually eat the worms. They eat the compost. They're competing with the worms for the compost. But they're not going to hurt worms. Uh, if you follow my lime discussion, that will get rid of the uh, millipedes for you. So the last item, item number five, is feeding and watering. Now here is where most people kill their worms. So let me talk about feeding and watering. Uh, you can kill your worms with kindness. You will notice I have a lot of worms. But what you don't see is food strode all through this bed. You will see food. They got some paper. They've got some watermelon. And they got a little feed right there. And yeah, I could probably feed them today. These worms are ready to be fed. But uh, you don't see a bed full of food. Now I have seen YouTube videos. YouTube videos where people take a container like this and just fill it chock full of vegetables, chopped up or whatever, and throw the worms in there and tell you that's the way to raise your worms. Or paper. You know what? No. That is the way absolutely to kill your worms. That will absolutely, will that question kill all of your worms. Now here's why. This is the most important thing I can possibly tell you about raising worms. Uneaten food becomes acidic. And as we mentioned earlier, a worm's physiology, his whole body is like the inside of your mouth. What does that mean? That means that worm is going to have some severe problems in an acid bed. The acid will kill them. Uneaten food will go acidic. So you don't want to put any more food in a bed than a worm is going to eat in a matter of a couple days. Now something like a watermelon rind that you can get away from, you know, is a bit of an exception. But, uh, and they will eat on them and come to them and get away. But you don't want a bed full of food. Uh, like this is ground up grain. Actually, that's hen layer mash. I don't use too much of that. You need to buy it organic when you can. Uh, don't use, try to stay away from GMO stuff. Oh, uh, uh, you can also for bedding, you could use wood chips and leaves once they have been composted and well broken down. Worms can break that down. And that's what I'm going to move to in, in the future for bedding, just kind of as a go back. Now, uh, feed your worms just what they'd eat in a day. And if you put dry feed out on the bed, just sprinkle a little water on it. In fact, that's how you water your worm, just a little sprinkle. A little sprinkle about every day or every other day. Every other day is fine. In the summertime, you may want to sprinkle water them a little bit every day just to keep the heat down, depending on what your uh, humidity is. So, um, but you have to just go beside, dig into your bed, see how things are looking. Especially if it's dry, give them some water. Anytime you give them dry food, give them water. So just water them a little bit, just to sprinkle. You don't drown them with water. And I don't use tap water. What I do for my water is I have water sitting around in, in containers just uh, letting the uh, uh, chloride seep out. I do have uh, tap water right now. I am going to put a well in. But uh, that's the key thing. What most people do, again, is they overfeed the worms. They kill them with kindness. And they do it because that's what all the YouTube videos say do. And all those YouTube videos are wrong, and everybody follows them, and they kill the worms. So what I'm going to give you in my videos is the truth. I'm going to tell you how to raise your worms and keep them alive. Don't overfeed them. I've had people, I've told them several times they were overfeeding the worms. They go, no, I'm not, no, I'm not. And then later they come back to me, I figure out what's killing my worms. I go, what? Uh, I've been overfeeding them. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes you tell them that, they don't quite get it because their mind is set with these videos they've seen on YouTube from all these other people making a bed out of food and sticking worms in it. 
that's nuts don't do that you know you're just asking for problems for mold for bad bacteria anaerobic bacteria and all kind of stuff to be in there that you don't want so again uh, that's the key points feed your worms uh, lightly water them lightly and uh, they will thank you for it they will grow they will reproduce I mean here's the proof I have worms there's no doubt about it look at this you see that I've got worms and you can have worms too so just remember that and uh, you will do well so ladies and gentlemen once again there's gonna be many more updates you're gonna get the truth the honest poop scoop on how to raise worms and do gardening it's not going to be some hype that you're going to get because somebody's trying to make a bunch of youtube videos about something they don't know anything about i see that all the time i know about raising worms i got worms and you can have worms too <laughs> so to get the scoop to get the truth the honest how to watch my videos i'm going to have all kind of videos of stuff i'm doing and you can see what's working so uh to see all the future videos, first you got to subscribe to my channel, then bang the bell for update notifications. And uh, I thank you for watching. Have a nice day or night.